All right, so I'm hoping this will be a quick video. You'll see all these blades here. Today we're going to quickly discuss the Bowie knife. All right, I'll try to give you guys a little bit of a history on it. And uh, you like this pro camera work here? <laughs> trying to set myself up. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Jim Bowie was in a, this thing called the Sandbar Incident or the Sandbar Fight that took place in 1827. And uh, it was like a duel. He was attacked by uh, several dudes. Uh, I think he took out three people. He was stabbed with uh, cane swords. I believe he was shot as well. And uh, everybody's always wondered what that knife was because today, you know, we got things like this. Right? So I brought this out and all these others because I want to talk about Bowie knife design with a little bit of the history and kind of in a way about how we got here to this. Now, what we know is, is that uh, Jim Bowie had a knife that was described as a large butcher knife. The best description we have of it comes from his brother in, I believe it was 1838, where he said he made that knife for his brother Jim. And this knife right here, which is just your standard kind of kitchen knife, actually fits the parameters of what his brother, I think his name was Reason Bowie, uh, what he had. He said he had a nine inch blade, which is what this is. And that's it. There was no cross guard, nothing. Now, pretty good chance that it was much thicker than this. And I'm gonna put a link in the description of this video to a guy whose name escapes me at the moment, but he goes to the knife shows. It's an older video. And it's fascinating because he has a knife that absolutely belonged to Jim Bowie. Jim Bowie gave the knife to a famous actor of the time. I believe it was like 1834. Now, nobody's saying that this particular knife is the knife that he used at the sandbar incident. Just want to get that across. But when I watched this video, I did a lot of screenshots on it. I, I've got, I did more research. I found pictures of that blade. Uh, on a scale. I know how long the blade is. I know how long the handle is. I know that the handle uh, is a full tang with scales on either side. I know that the blade, we did it on this knife here actually, which I still haven't finished. Uh, still work on this. Uh, it's getting kind of beat up here. See how it's very thick here, about a quarter of an inch thick here, but then it tapers down nice and thin to about an eighth of an inch here at the pommel. All right, That's how the blade is that Bowie gave to this actor. Now, uh, this blade is documented. We know, we know it came from Jim Bowie. We know it was in this guy's collection for a very long time. And now this new guy has it. So I want you to look at that link and watch that video if you're interested in this and get that history. Because that is probably either, if it's not the same knife he used at the sandbar incident, it's probably pretty similar to the knife he had at the sandbar incident. My guess is, you know, he had that knife who knows what happened to it, and then he went and had another knife made to mimic it. I can't tell you when the cross guards come along, but here's another blade I picked up. And by the way, most of this, a lot of this is for sale, not all of it. But uh, I kind of picked this up because it was inexpensive. It's bone handle, it's a full tang, no cross guard. And this kooky thing here, I don't really know what that's called. I've seen it before. I've done it before in different wooden blade things I've had to make for people for fun. But this here, to me, is probably pretty close to what a lot of guys carried uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, possibly without that. I think a lot of them were more triangle shaped. So uh, it's pretty amazing because we go from that to eventually getting to this style with a big old brass cross guard and all that. In the 1950s, there was a film made. Uh, it was called The Iron Mistress. And the blade that they made in that became what we accept today as a modern Bowie knife. However, before that, in World War II, these were actually issued. All right? And this is, I'm convinced, I've done a ton of research on it now, this is a genuine World War II case double X uh, Bowie. And what happened was, and I know it because this handle stinks and I didn't know but original uh, Bakelite vintage Bakelite has this pungent kind of smell to it so you know I also know that because it has steel uh, uh, rivets in the handle there uh, that's a third generation case double X World War II 
So, and I could tell by looking at it, they tried to polish the brass on this and everything. Really, really cool. Now, the reason I have all these blades out here is just because I wanted to talk about, I just love the Bowie knife shape. I think it's a good shape for doing just about anything. The U.S. military agreed to the point where they literally issued these. All right. Here's a Vietnam era, 1966-67 Western Bowie. This has the most comfortable handle out of all of these. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, cross guard is a great idea on a knife that you might fight with somebody with because if the blades happen to hit one another and one blade comes down on the other, you know, you're going to hit the cross guard. It's not going to cut into your hand. If you read, oh, I forgot to bring it. I'll insert at the end of this a screenshot of the book cover. I got this great book on Bowie knife fights. The guy did all this research and he's got every documented Bowie knife uh, incident where somebody, it was used to defend or take someone out throughout the history of the Bowie knife, going all the way up to the Gulf War. Amazing, amazing read. I haven't read the whole book yet, but I've thumbed through it and read a lot of it. I read a lot of the stories in it. Brutal stuff, man. Brutal stuff. But originally, no cross guard. And keep in mind, I mean, knives go back thousands and thousands of years, so there's nothing really new here. And even when you do your research on genuine vintage knives from the early 19th century, you will see everything from things that are very crudely made to knives that look like they could have been made last year. Uh, right now. It's amazing. I've even seen ergonomic shapes to the handles with applied scales, full tang. Mind-blowing that it's from that period. So there were skilled people back then making quality stuff and people just making stuff to work. And really that's all that needs to happen. Um, in the South, in the 1820s, uh, knives were heavily influenced by the Spanish. Uh, the conquistadors were there in like 1520, something like that. And a lot of those blades are very triangular in shape, and then they, they're, a lot of them are very highly decorated on the blades. The Mexican blades are known for that. This happens to be a Mexican buoy. I'm not sure when this is from. Uh, I believe it's probably from, it could be mid-century. It could be the 1950s or 60s. It's uh, made in Mexico. This is something that you would buy when you go down there. It's got the guy's name, Casa Charles. I believe there's a lot of these out there. I don't know if these are worth money at it, at, at right now, but I think they should be because this guy was prolific. And I love that they made enough room here for you to wrap your finger around to use it. And I don't know what this steel is, uh, but it takes a great edge. And this knife has been used. So he's got a nice fuller in here. That's a great knife. Um, I didn't want to, I don't have all the she's out here for everything. Uh, but again, it just blows my mind that some, I wanted to say a TV show invented it, but again, this came along before the 1950s. So this was an accepted shape style for the Bowie knife with a big old brass cross guard for quite some time. Now this blade here, which is kind of a fantasy uh, Bowie, I picked up, it's a Rough Rider Bowie as if this was a knife that uh, the Rough Riders carry, right? With uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. But what's neat about this blade shape is when you start looking at these knives, a lot of the knives that came out of Texas had that super long clip point and sweeping clip point. A lot of the times the back part of the knife, actually this has it, the back here is swept up. This has a long sweeping clip. The only thing is, is it doesn't have enough of a belly uh, to, to match what you see in a lot of the Texas blades. Like this looks more like a Texas buoy, you know what I'm saying? But what you really had back then, generally speaking, they did, did tend to be a little bit smaller. Every once in a while, some bigger knife comes along. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this particular blade, uh, it's really cool. It's very comfortable. It's not too heavy. But they, it's a Pakistan-made knife. They just, if you're going to go this far with it and try to make it look like that, don't go crazy with these scales, right? This looks like it was made in the, yeah, I mean, obviously it's a new knife. It's not that old. It might not even be 10 years old. But adding these black brass little strips in there with these little blocks of wood, which is the reason why they had to pin it so much to hold it in place. It's like made with scrap wood. Uh, the handle shape, you've seen stuff like that going way back. But that, and as much as I like this on a blade, like a modern blade, back then they wouldn't have had it. And in most cases, the blade, uh, the sharp edge of the blade would have gone all the way down to the hilt here, all the way down to the cross guard. 
like you see here on this case, World War II version. Uh, by the 60s, they were doing stuff like this. I believe that uh, the Western buoy version from World War II, I know it just had a steel elliptical cross guard. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that the cutting edge goes all the way to the cross guard on that as well. That's just typical of the time period. I feel like this here, they could have done that. It would have been a much nicer knife to own and have, especially if you're in a cowboy action shooting and you're a period guy. You do these things where you get these costumes that you put on and the whole dress up thing, the Civil War reenactors, all that stuff. America, huh? <laughs> like Even people who you would consider poor here in the States somehow still find the ability to spend thousands of dollars to dress up uh, the way people dressed a couple hundred years ago <laughs> blows my mind. I'm not knocking it. All those guys know a lot about history. So uh, I just thought that was kind of cool. You've got modern versions of the buoy that are very cheaply made, like this here, which I'm sure is a Pakistan. Yep, yep, even says it right there. But you see this here. This is an inexpensive copy, really, of the Western. You know, the blade's taller in profile this way. You can see that, and the cross guard is just ridiculous. The cool thing about these is, is they're so inexpensive, and I should just do this. I'm going to be doing some work. i got to make a handle for a hatchet, uh, for a tomahawk, for a friend of mine. But I'm going to probably taper this here down. Maybe I'll work on this cross guard a little bit, make it more comfortable, a little bit cooler, eventually make a leather sheath for it. This is not a terrible knife. You'd be shocked uh, what these knives can actually handle if you watch these videos of people using them. It is a full tang, but nothing to write home about. Now, uh, you've got this original and uh, World War II case double X here. This is such a desirable knife. Now, you can get originals for, you, sometimes you can find them for under $400, but they're usually four, five, six hundred dollars in that range. And then for some reason, you'll see some of them that they want $2,000 or more, but that's coming in with a provenance. It belonged to a real like Marine Raider or so they're telling you. Uh, there was uh, Kin folks made them, Case made them, Western made them. Uh, what is it? The uh, Collins Legitimus. That's the one I would like to have. Uh, the cool rarer ones have the greener, uh, the green colored bone handle on them. I've handled one of those before. Feels just like this one. And uh, they're really neat, but nowadays they're also making these knockoffs. And it's funny because these things can be priced pretty high. Uh, I've seen these for over $100, and I've seen them for $30. So it's crazy. They're all the same. It's a stainless steel blade. This is made in China. It's more of like a commemorative Marine Raider buoy uh, for the modern Marine Raiders. The handle on this one is tighter in my hand. I have a lot more room on this one in my hand. This is way more... When you hold this, I got to tell you, just something magical happens. There's something weird. I feel this energy off this knife. I know it sounds corny, but it's the truth. I don't know. The, who knows what this knife has done? You know what I'm saying? Could have set quite a few souls free, if you know what I'm saying. What's interesting to me is that that knife, and again, this is, I'm just showing you this just so you know, this is not real as far as the real thing. It's just a modern, and this blade is horrible, or excuse me, the sheath. No retention, no retention strap, nothing. What's interesting to me is that this was issued to troops going into the South Pacific, right? Army troops, all of that. It also ended up in, we got a helicopter coming, of course. Uh, this also ended up in uh, flight crew survival kits. So a lot of these were on airplanes, which is part of the reason why you, if you find one of these that's still coming with its original leather sheath, it's pretty well tooled. It has the number 13 embossed on it, those original sheaths. Um, that probably came out of an airplane, if I was guessing. Uh, if you find one of these and it's not coming with its original sheath, I think you're more likely, I think it's easier for you to assume that it potentially is a real war knife from the South Pacific because those leather sheaths literally just rotted away. They just fell apart. One of the reasons why they want the Bakelite handle as well because this here with the leather stacked handle oftentimes rotted right off the knife. This has been oiled. If you have a leather stacked handle, you definitely want to oil it, okay? This uh, K-Bar was being used by the Marines at the same time this was being used. Now, 
this is designed for doing all sorts of other camp chores and in particular just cutting down things to get through a jungle like you can actually use this you can this can function like a machete 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 uh, and this here you, know, you if you're gonna open cans or whatnot i think you're better off using this than this all right the tang on this i've seen these where the handles busted off the tang comes it's very square it comes all the way across just past this back, back pin and it's squared off there. It's very thick. This would be still considered a full tang knife, even though the, it's totally encased in Bakelite. Uh, this one, as we know, is more of a, it's hard to say a rat tail, but it does come straight down here and it's pinned uh, on the backside through the pommel there. Now, another thing that was uh, happening in World War II was this Woodman's Pow in this metal case. Uh, this was made in uh, 1941 before the war broke out, or 1940 possibly, and uh, these were issued to troops as well. Uh, also uh, air crews, I believe. I could be wrong about that one. And I just, I've always seen these. I recently got into them. I picked up a few, traded one, but I, I couldn't resist this. <laughs> Somebody took one of these Woodman's Pals and turned it into a buoy. And I, I paid up for this. I will probably never sell this. You would have to, if you offered me a crazy amount of money, because I want to tell you right now, I paid over $200 for this silly thing, uh, <laughs> which may or may not have been a good idea. This is also the patent, pen. this says Victor Tool Company on it. Uh, it's got a patent number on it. So it's this is an older version. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's too cool for school, man. You know, there's a few of these knives. I'm, I'm holding on to this. I'm holding on to the Western. I'm holding on to the Case Double X. I'm holding, this is my original K-Bar from when I was in the core. So I'm not getting rid of those. The rest of these things I don't care too much about. Now, a lot of people, this is called the V44 from World War II, but a lot of people also like to call it the Marine Raider buoy. Um, interestingly, Ontario Knife Company has made this. So this here, if you're into these and you want yourself a buoy knife and something that's tough, this is a quarter inch thick steel. It'll do anything. It's got the cross guard that's kind of reminiscent of the Western from World War II. Well, this is much thicker. It's a little odd to me the way they designed this, but I understand it. And uh, you can get yourself one of these and you can see the comparison with the blades. I think you should be able to see that. They're... It's slightly longer, the new one. It's obviously thicker, and uh, but it's got that nice belly to it and the clip point. It's pretty cool. I recently did a video on this, which is the Condor. I've been in touch with them. I did eventually get it to fit in the sheath. I put this in the sheath for a while and forgot about it. And then when I pulled it out, it stretched the sheath out enough where I can sink this in all the way finally. So I'm happy about that. This is really interesting to me because, you know, I'm talking to, I like military used uh, weapons, knives, firearms, that sort of thing. And what I dug about this is it has, it's a slightly exaggerated version of the Marine Corps buoy. But what they also did here is they kind of done this thing where they're hearkening back to the Old West, right? So it takes us back to this uh, Rough Rider buoy, right? And you can see more of a, uh, a uh, belly to this. But then they've got what they call the coffin handle end on it. In my opinion, that should be flared out more. Um, I'm not a fan of this particular uh, handle. It's just too small in my hand. There's not enough to grip. I prefer a thicker grip uh, to the knife uh, handle because it just, you know, it's good purchase, you know. And uh, that's what you want. To me, this is a little bit too dainty, but I understand it. But I, what I appreciate about this design is... It has that te that later period. This would be like 18, uh, I suppose, late 1830s, 1840s, 50s, where they started making the knives bigger, fatter. Uh, if the top of this blade was slightly arced, and uh, if you're going to take the time to do this, I always say it should be big enough to put a finger in. And if the handle was a little bit fatter on this, you would have a perfect blend, in my opinion. This is the Undertaker buoy. You would have a perfect blend of you know, your vintage Texas style with your Marine Raider and it'd be much cooler. It'd only take a few details to change that, but I still love this, but I don't care about it. So you can buy these new for around $100. Uh, then we get to this here. Now, Cold Steel, if you guys are familiar with the Cold Steel, 
uh, company. I mean, they go all out, man. They got a swivel here on this so that when you put it on your belt, you can sit down and it's comfortable. I mean, it seems to be Cold Steel's like, okay, we're going to pull out all the stops. We're going to, you want to, you want to talk about buoys? We're not making buoys. We're going to make a buoy. Uh, <laughs> by the way, it is buoy, not Bowie. David Bowie took the name buoy, right? But he didn't know how to pronounce it correctly. He just said Bowie because <laughs> it sounded tough. He wanted a tough name to be on stage, you know? And that's why we all say Bowie today because of David Bowie. But the family will correct you and they'll tell you it's Bowie. Look at this friggin' thing. I mean, look how exaggerated. It's, it's almost a caricature of a Bowie knife. And this is no joke. You could take this out in the woods right now and beat the hell out of it. And it'll hold, it should hold up pretty well. Um, and the polishing is nothing to write home about. But look at how ridiculously large it is. I mean, this is a, a knife that was used in the jungles in Vietnam, combat knife, right? And I'm pretty certain this one was over there based on the pitting that you would get from being in the jungle and everything and it not coming with a sheath. It's been cleaned up, obviously, and I did quite a bit of cleaning up on it when I got it. But just look at the, the oversized nature of this cross guard. It's way over the top, man. And the size of the blade, I mean, this is... This is, it's, it's either you look at this like it's a, uh, a cartoon version, or this would be good for a guy like my brother, who weighs, I don't even know what he weighs, and Carl, don't get mad at me, because I'm not making fun of you, but he could weigh 300 pounds, my brother, he's a big man, big, big man, I give, I give my brother a hug, I can't get my arms around him, that's how big he is, and he's like 6'3", man, so a man like him, of his stature, boom, this is perfect. I mean, I'm sure if Carl was holding both of these knives right now and he had this one, this would feel dainty to him. And to me, it's perfect. It's perfect. This thing, it's just, it seems too big for me, honestly. Just it's a little bit, it's way more than you need. But for a guy like Carl, big people, they got big stuff out there. Watches too. I got this Aragon watch coming. It might be here today. And I, it's either 45 or 50 millimeters across on the case. It's a massive watch. So we'll see how that goes. But I dig on this cold steel blade, and I feel like, I forget what this costs. I think it's around $100 as well. Um, I just, I feel like cold steel, out of all of these blades, they really put the time in on this. I mean, they did a great job on the sheath. Uh, I believe a lot of these westerns came with a similar sheath to this with the uh, swivel setup. I feel like I gotta commend Cold Steel on this. Uh, I feel like if you want to get, if you're especially if you're a bigger man, or a gigantic woman, I suppose, <laughs> or a man who is a big man who is now a woman who also happens to be in the Bowie knives, uh, <laughs> this is for you. But I just, I look at what they did with this. I mean, they really went all out on the details of this. I just, I think, good job, Cold Steel. Nice job. And then I guess lastly, what we're going to talk about here is uh, this here, which it was a good deal. I don't remember what I paid for it, but I wanted to show it to you because of the Kydex sheath, right? The modern kind of thing. It locks itself in there. There's good uh, blade retention, even without the uh, Velcro here. It's always nice to have. And it's a shrade. And I'll tell you, I, I've never been disappointed with Schrade knives. Look at the shape of that blade. Undeniable. Clearly a buoy. Um, there's some dude, I think he designed this blade. Had it made, and Schrade may have actually copied the design. It's the SCHF45. A big honk of steel. Full tang. Skinny scales applied. Uh, uncomfortable. This point right here digs into your hand, hot spots everywhere. I, I've played around with this thing quite a bit, just handling it. I'll do that with all my knives. I could just tell you from doing this sort of thing that uh, you're going to want to put a pair of gloves on with this if you're actually chopping with it. But I bring it up because I believe it was pretty inexpensive. And if you're like me, I don't really have an example in front of me right here, but you, if you've watched enough of my videos, I mean the knife here, you've seen I'll reprofile handles a lot. And that's what I would do with this if I were you. If you're a guy like me that likes to tinker, you got a shop, you can mess with a blade, uh, pop these scales off, 
put some wood scales on it, and then reshape everything. Round this over, you can get rid of that lanyard hole, you can round that over, you can create a little bit of a bird's beak here. This is fatter than it needs to be. If you thicken the, the, the uh, scales up down here, you can thin it down this way a little bit more, it'll still fit in your hand nicely. Uh, but yeah, I think this is a perfect candidate to be reprofiled into something far more ergonomic and cooler. Uh, so this is like a, this would be like a project blade. But uh, again, I might give this away to somebody, possibly sell it. I don't know. Keep in mind, if you make me an offer on anything, there's still shipping involved in that sort of thing. So, um, But I'm open to selling a lot of stuff. Anyhow, that's what's happening. I, I, I really dig the blade on this, but to me, it's a, it's a kooky knife. Uh, it just, it harkens. It's just got the, the styling of a Texas Arkansas, now you, what they call an Arkansas toothpick is a lot longer, a lot thinner, uh, but it has a lot of, it just screams Texas to me. I mean, it seems like this, this sort of, of uh, blade shaped style, other than this uh, little finger choil here, uh, seems like something that would be similar to something carried at the Alamo, to be honest with you. So uh, anyhow, that's my thing on buoys. Uh, I've been, I got into this. It's always been a thing. My dad had a Sologen steel buoy knife when I was a kid. It had lion killer etched in the blade and he beat the hell out of it. He broke the tip off. My grandfather ground it down for him, didn't do a great job. Uh, the bone scales got broken away. My grandfather made some wooden scales for him, but he thinned the handle too much. My dad put wire around it and duct tape. It was just, by the time it came to me, it was basically garbage. And I was friends with a guy who owns a tattoo parlor here in town, and he's friends with the guy whose name escapes me, but he's got a big time uh, sword company here in Los Angeles. He made the hook for the movie Hook. He's constantly, he makes chain mail, and anytime they need armor, knives, blades, whatever, he does it. And so it was uh, a deal the guy owed me. So we actually took a Damascus steel buoy blade and fit that to the original handle. And I believe he put some bone scales on it for me. He overpolished it, in my opinion, uh, so that it's got an eagle head uh, at the pommel, which uh, works to grip your hand, right? Just very similar to this. It's very cool, but he, he polished some of the details out of it. And when I found my brother in 2001 and we got to be tight, I gave him that knife. So uh, that's what happened to that one. Eagle heads on knives have always been a very common theme. So kind of neat. Uh, I don't know if you're going to get any, anything out of this. I collected these because I was into it, and the goal was always to find one of these. And I'm just tickled pink over it. Now, somebody wrecked it. There's a lot of pitting on this that has been buffed out that you can still see. I don't know if you can see it on screen. But there's pitting clear as day on this blade. Uh, somebody over went crazy with a buffing wheel, and they polished out this brass, and they tried to clean it up because they did not know what they're doing. If you find an old knife and you're not sure about it, it's got what's called a Bakelite handle and you smell it and it's got that pungent, weird scent to it and it's rusty and pitted, yeah, don't screw with that. Just get it, you can clean it. You can wipe it down, you can clean it up. You can use a little 4 out steel wool and some WD-40 or something uh, to make it a little bit more presentable get the rust, stop the rust from happening, right? Rust is a cancer. But uh, don't screw with that too much because to a lot of collectors, this is ruined. Now, because I found it like this, it's not ruined. This is a, a treasure that was discovered. So to me, this is awesome and it doesn't bother me. Uh, and it was the only way I was able to get such a good deal on it. <laughs> I got an incredible, I got this for a steal. It was basically stolen. I feel like I practically hit somebody over the head and took it from them. It was a very good deal. So I'm keeping this, like I said, I'm keeping this Western, which is, it is my favorite. I think it feels great. The Woodsman's Pal, this one, my K-Bar, but the rest of these, I mean, I nobody wants this thing. But <laughs> you guys let me know. I just thought you'd appreciate this. I'll, uh, maybe I'll give you a quick hover over this. I don't know if it's really needed. Anyhow. I'm done with this now. I'm over it. I got the stuff I want. I'm sending this one here to my nephew in a care package with a, with a watch and a couple things for my sister and my niece. And then everything else. 
I'm going to figure it out, you know? <laughs> I got a lot of the stuff because I wanted to do the video talking about it and talking about the history of it because it's just such a cool American thing. And I'll tell you, don't feel bad if you're watching this from some other country. I guarantee you, and you could probably tell me this, if you're watching this, you're into knives, right? There are blade shapes, blade styles uh, from every country all over the planet. And uh, those people love those styles because of the historical uh, importance to the history of their particular part of the world. And that's how I feel about this. I mean, you see this, you're talking America, the USA, man. No screwing around. That's what you think when you see this knife. And that's what I am, you know. And having been a Marine, uh, same thing here with this. I like to imagine. There's no way I could prove it. Uh, I like to imagine some Marine Raider had this blade on uh, Guadalcanal and, uh, you know, possibly used it for its purpose. You know what I'm saying? So that's it for now. Have a good day. Be kind to one another. I, I don't know how this video is going to come off. I'm a little off my game at the moment. So I'm thinking about walking away from a gig. You'll probably see that video. I may have posted it already. Uh, I won't get into that too much right now. But, uh, yeah, that's what's happening. If I haven't said it already, be good to one another. Have a great day, and I'll, hopefully I'll see you again.